and in, ha, has proven in municipalities across the country to to drive and inspire investment. Um, that if a place looks nicer, it feels nicer, it attracts people more, uh, property values go up, um, and 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 uh, investment is attracted there. And so our, our strategy really was to um, look at the public right of way and um, really the kind of sidewalk area and, and think about the lessons learned from the kind of temporary uh, seating areas and seating areas that were provided because of COVID uh, to think about a strategy that balances an expansion of pedestrian and restaurant and cafe seating area with parking to have um, parking dot, not dominate, a, a, a kind of dominate the kind of vision of the street to push more of that parking to the side streets. Um, and then think very carefully about um, the rhythm of outdoor seating areas and parking relative to existing businesses and buildings that we think can um, more likely support buildings that would use that outdoor space in the future. And so that that that's the kind of the, the, the drawing that you see um, that Sarah has on the screen. And if you can pan down a little bit, Sarah, uh, we looked at this um, both in a very targeted area, but also uh, a, a, across a larger area of the downtown. We also included um, locations along the street and you can see those with the red rectangles on the plan that um, uh, are uh, potential locations in the future for infill development. Now those locations are um, mostly parking lots, parking areas, but um, uh, you know, uh, uh, new buildings there that have commercial or residential uses on the upper floors and kind of activating uses on the ground floor would help contribute to um, the sense of destination of the street and the kind of liveliness of the public realm. And as Sarah was pointing out, um, what's cool about the website, if you click on some of those dots, is that a lot of those points that I'm making um, come up as kind of pop-ups or um, the, some of the intentions are, are uh, understood when you are navigating the website by just hitting on some of those, those buttons, which are highlighted by a color and a little plus inside of them. Um, so that, that's the logic. And if you pan down, Sarah, there's a, 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 a street view um, that shows that mix of outdoor seating areas and parking um, running down the street so that you can always see people sitting outside or walking on both sides of the street. But in almost every block, there's also some convenient parking too uh, to signal that it's also welcome for people that are driving in from, out, from outside the area. Um, it's also important that um, uh, those aspects of the public right of way, which include the roadbed, include um, that zone, the zones for parking, uh, bicycle accommodations, uh, the sidewalk surface itself, lighting and street trees um, are conceived of uh, altogether um, uh, through a series of streetscape improvement projects to turn a street that's mostly thought of as a, as a conveyance for cars into a true public space that has, uh, that's unified by those qualities. And so that this, this, this drawing tries to capture some of that intention. Is there anything Taskina um, uh, that I didn't mention that's worth mentioning? Um, yeah, I would just add that in the previous drawing, we also show um, locations of existing parking garages um, and other parking lots to show that there is parking available within walking distance from Main Street. So even though we are removing some parking from Main Street, there's parking just all around Main Street that could, the public could be redirected to. Yeah, and that 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 uh, that um, is most successful uh, through a, a coordinated wayfinding strategy that uh, would include uh, communicating, um, you know, with Nashua as a destination, even on websites and through individual businesses where parking, community parking, is actually located even before 
regional and you know New England visitors come. Uh, it includes uh, signage. It might include electronic signage to um, communicate parking availability. But uh, that would also uh, both allow um, more of the space along Main Street to be used for pedestrian activities, seating, and bicycle accommodations, but would also um, uh, communicate uh, to customers and a kind of broader audience that um, that that parking is available nearby. Yes, Judy. Um, I have a question. Uh, why did you stop where you did uh, rather than go up to Railroad Square or, or um, Lowell Street? Because I think most people consider up through Railroad Square as part of downtown and the hunts there, the, there's restaurants there, there's all sorts of things on both sides of the road. And, you know, we always heard that downtown was from the hunt to the hunt and yet it's chopped off here. Yeah, I think it, it's a good question. I, I think there's there's two answers. One is that, um, you know, this is a snapshot of a strategy as part of a citywide plan. Um, we we aren't scoped to do a kind of comprehensive the comp the, the actual comprehensive plan of uh, of with a level of specificity. Um, this is an illustration of the intentions of what this might look like. And so the decision was made to take a stretch of Main Street that had the range of typical conditions that a project like this, when it went to the next stages, would have to tackle, you know, opportunities for infill development, um, locations where um, a space for outdoor seating was justified versus not, um, a, a section of Main Street where we could consider um, uh, parking areas uh, in parking garages and parking lots off Main Street that would be part of the illustration. So it's a um, it's a kind of sampling of the range of strategies that in an actual project, I, I agree, Judith, would um, set more specific scope limits and maybe different scope limits and, um, and, and maybe a larger territory. But I think it's a really good comment because I agree with you about the area that you're talking about. Could I, could I chime in? Could I chime in a second? Sarah? Absolutely. So, so for the record, Tim Cummings, Director of Economic Development. I think Judy raises a really good point, and it's actually a question that I have, which maybe merits some discussion, which is where do you anchor, you know, the start and the stop of this type of road condition? Um, and uh, it is awful, often something that we've struggled with. We, we essentially stopped it before the Main Street Bridge, but... Would it is it something the community would like to see this continue on up to uh, Concord and Amherst Street intersection, uh, essentially the Hunt Building, and then similarly and probably just as important because the physical built environment is dramatically different as you go south on Main Street. Wh what is the community's expectations for going, keeping this type of road condition going south? And is it's where would you like to stop it or where would where, where would it end? And I think I think that type of feedback from this group and others along the way is something we really need to kind of drill down, dr drill down into. So sorry for taking up the time. That's perfect. Judy, love, love to hear. Yes, and, you know, when you look at what's going on right now with the current barriers, there are barriers um, behind the hunt. Uh, in front of the two restaurants there. It's not like we haven't done it. And there's a parking lot there too. So, um, you know, we already have barriers in place in front of the two restaurants over in that area. Yes, th this plan was inspired by, you know, the, the, the COVID installations as, as really a map of, 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 where already today there is demand for these things to happen. So we used aerial views of um, those extensions of the pedestrian realm to inspire some of these decisions. I, I think Tim's question is also an important one. Um, 
And um, one of the, the things I would offer is that um, the, the choice about the extent of this kind of project would be partly driven by funding sources and kind of bang for the buck. So um, I would say it's generally to start with a relatively smaller section at a higher quality than extend with a the same budget, a much larger area where the impacts are less noticeable um, and less profound. I also think that um, part of the goal of this is to create a park once and walk destination. Um, and so the other consideration would be um, in terms of a length that somebody was going to promenade up and down Main Street, um, how does that dimension measure against a stroll somebody would take? Um, uh, and I think the last piece of it is where are the existing businesses and establishments that are already in a way seeding this idea that already create the context for that decision? Because I, I think too long can be a problem in a way because it, it takes the it, it starts to weaken the placemaking potential of a strategy like this. Um, That's, uh, so, thank you, Tim. And we will go to the South Main Street extent in just a sec, but Marianne, do you have a question or a comment? Yeah, I, um, I just wanted to respond and follow up with Judy and Tim's comments. Um, I, again, when we first put the barriers out last year, there was some discussion about it. And I think it's a real fine balance between how far up do you go and looking at the need to um, move traffic safely through the Amherst Concord Main Street intersection because um, we have a lot of traffic going through there. Um, I guess, you know, in my mind, probably barriers no farther than um, Franklin and, and Bridge Street. Um, only, or yeah, canal, um, only be, and then, you know, people can pull into railroad square to parking, but I think to do barriers farther north um, doesn't really get you anything. And um, I think the hunt and all of those buildings in railroad square can be accessed in other ways. And, and there's just all that traffic up there to deal with. Thank you. Does anybody else have any ideas on that too? Um, I have just a quick comment that I think it's really critical that we make sure that there's sort of a, a bypass accessible um, that's still safe for neighborhoods, but for, for cars that don't wanna drive down Main Street at a sort of a slower speed and sort of enjoy everything Main Street would offer, could go down Water Street and Pine Street and, and go that way or um, on the Spring Street other side. That's a great comment. Thank you, Betsy. Paul? Um, some years ago, um, James Bayo had floated the idea of making uh, the Railroad Square and Lowell Street area kind of this, this circulating uh, kind of waste. You've got, uh, you've got kind of going up Main Street, uh, taking a right down Lowell Street, coming back down, taking a right onto Canal Street. And then you've got effectively this giant triangular rotary, for lack of a better term. Um, and, and this idea created some potential for uh, reduction of lanes uh, with, within that space and um, uh, placement of uh, angular uh, which helped to solve the parking pinch uh, for that that neck of the woods. Um, you know, I, I don't know how practical that is, but I, I think it's an idea worth uh, weighing as as we kind of look at this. I, I generally agree that um, uh, kind of kind of pushing the um, e extension of of the, the pedestrian sidewalk space out beyond Franklin Canal. Uh, might not make all that that much sense, or or you know provide the value that we're looking for versus other people use. But I think that there might be some opportunities to maximize parking um, and kind of visit traffic flow in that area. That's a great point, Paul. And um, 
Julie could probably give us the more specific dimensions, but we did actually recently receive a, um, a grant from NHDOT that even though they told us we've received it, we won't actually get the dollars for two or three years, but um, to actually really evaluate that Franklin Canal orange triangle intersection and do kind of the, the firsthand traffic studies and analysis to understand maybe what would be possible to be able to better facilitate traffic flow and parking in that area. So that is on the books and it's, I'm glad you brought it up as an important future evaluation area. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, that's fantastic. Thanks. Sarah? Yes. Hi, Gloria McCarthy. Hi. Um, hi. Sorry, I was late. Uh, dog issues. No problem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yep. So he's, he's old. So <laughs> um, I just want to say, I mean, we're fortunate that we have a very wide main street. If it were just an average size main street, we would be having, you know, more issues than we have as far as traffic goes. But if you're planning anything, I mean, things have been talked about over the years, angled parking, all sorts of different ways to try and get better parking areas mm -hmm. and whatnot. And if you're going to be taking spaces like this, for restaurants, uh, you, you're going to have to be aware of parking issues because I, I happen to get, and I don't know if it can show up on the screen, but I got this on a package this week when I was shopping downtown. And it's, you know, do you have parking issues? We love our restaurants, but so there's already a little bit of pushback going on. So that's, you know, available parking is going to have to be something that is going to have to be really considered. And that's a great point. Um, I, and just to reiterate, you know, what you're seeing here on, on the website and what you've seen is right now we have barriers, right? And that's a temporary condition. And this is really talking about a future permanent condition and, and talking about making this, these bike lanes and these seats and these desig and these parking areas, um, a more permanent condition in the future. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to talk about this. Um, and yes, we do know that there is a great survey which should give us some good data going on about what people, how people feel about the parking or what is being used for outdoor dining right now downtown. Um, but I think if you think of all the places that you've visited that you love in the downtowns, it's generally not parking lots or parking right. out front. <laughs> oh, and, and I know there's a lot of parking downtown. We've got the parking garages. There's probably seven or 800 parking spaces in the downtown area. It's just people are not aware of them. So I think you need, you're gonna need better signage for that and just direction of how do people get to places because you know, otherwise all you hear is, oh, where are we gonna park? Where are we gonna park? For example, with the new Performing Arts Center, that's been the biggest question that's come up is where are you gonna put all these people? Where are they gonna park? Well, immediately came to mind, well, where did they all park when they ate downtown last year? But the answer is, well, there's this parking garage directly behind the building. So it's people are just not aware. So better better communication as far as parking. And even, even now with the barriers up, I think that's something that probably needs to be considered. That's a great point. Thank you. Um, Beth. Yeah, hi, Beth Tajum. Um, my question is the realization that summer doesn't last here 12 months a year. And there's some beautiful things being planned with the, the dining and things like that. But it's always been an issue in my mind that once it snows, that Main Street and other side streets can become unpassable because of the snow and the plowing and things like that. And I'm just wondering, you know, like, has any thought been put into what happens in the winter time? Absolutely. That's a great point, Beth. I think there's been a very concerted effort to do better with that, but it is something we're always working on because winter conditions are never easy here, nor are they predictable, right? Does anybody else have any comments on this? Um, concept for North Main Street before we move on to the South Main Street? Sarah, I just have a, a brief comment that I think some of the questions and observations about the impact of the beautification of Main Street as depicted um, would require before we moved ahead, a, a look at the impact of the larger circulation network 
in the parallel streets as um, Paul and others commented. And I think um, an analysis of, of the larger distribution network of cars uh, would want to be analyzed more to understand what the impacts would be. In, in, in a way, the distribution of traffic into more streets in the network might have the effect psychologically of making the traffic seem lower because if the habit is to always be on Main Street, but people learn new habits on side streets and back, back streets, the more that's distributed, the better. I think the other point is an important one the glory and a couple of other people have brought up is to understand um, the parking capacity, not only in parking garages and publicly available lots, but available street parking just off of Main Street. And I suspect with proper signage, signage and after getting an understanding of the, of the full capacity that we're talking about, and I'm only talking a block and a half from Main Street, uh, we might find there is excess capacity even um, to think about the extent that this project happens. But I, the, the, the final design of this would have to go hand in hand with a very careful look at, at, at the parking capacity within a block or a block and a half. Thanks, Tim. And I do know the parking department and Tim's here and Jill Stansfield have been working very much on understanding parking capacity and what that looks like as well. Sue Newman, you have a question? Or have yes. Uh, yeah, hi. Let me get my hand down here. Oh, well, I'll worry about that later. I can take care um, of that. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm awfully glad the comment got made about summer doesn't last forever. Um, I'm, I've appreciated all the comments that I've heard. And I'm, I'm just going to, um, I guess, piggyback on to what Mary Ann said. That traffic around the Library Hill area, especially at certain times of day, like late afternoon, 4.30, 4, 4 to maybe 5.30, it can get nuts. Um, so I, um, I, I think keeping things down a, a little more south is, is a wise thing. Also, um, the comment about using some of the other streets to maybe get around, I, I, we live, off of uh, Manchester Street. So if, for example, I wanna go to CVS on Main Street or down to the hospital area, we just come right down and get on Main Street and go. Um, I know there are alternative ways. You can use the Broad Street Parkway and come across like that. But I, I would just comment, I think there would be a learning curve for many people that just wanna get on Main Street and, and go south. Um, th th that's my comment. Thank you, Sue. Uh, Mary, and I think you had your hand next. Yeah, just um, a quick comment about available parking. And I'm going to preface this with saying, I don't know what the liability issues are, but um, I think we have a lot of very good business neighbors in the Main Street area who allow the public that knows to use their parking for free almost on Main Street parking. Um, I'm thinking of the bank down near City Hall. Um, I'm not gonna give away all the places I know. There are a couple other banks that allow us to use their parking. And, and I don't know if there's a way of working with them where um, instead of just saying, you know, parking lot reserved for um, customers during business hours, there's actually a really nice welcoming, well-designed sign that says public parking is welcomed after 5 p.m. or whatever. So it's it's better signed and you don't have to you know, go with someone who knows. And so I don't know if that's something, um, Paul working with the downtown group, um, that that we could look at but again i don't know what the lot the liability issues would be in in terms of being so open about parking um or parking at your own risk but there are lots of those little hidden spaces or not so little hidden spaces that's a great point thank you marianne betsy did you have hi uh, this is just a general question for everyone do we really need 
two tons of metal and plastic to move people less than three miles. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we could get to, and a lot of us are close enough to the center of the city that we can get to the center of the city without taking a car with us. Um, we, got a, we have a good bus system and it is walkable. Uh, my, my car has been sitting in my driveway for a long time. I know I'm fortunate and I'm very close to the center, but um, rather than focusing on parking, what if we think about changing to an environment where we can, we can walk and bike and bus and use the scooters to get around because the earth is burning and it's, it's fossil fuels are a huge part of it. Um, I'm begging people try to not use your car. Thank you, Betsy, that's a great point. And the scooters are available downtown now, you should try them out. <laughs> They're pretty fun, they're really stable. They're even more stable than the last ones. Does anybody else wanna talk about Northern Main Street before we go to the Southern concept, which is again, a snapshot, it's not the whole thing. And I do wanna to return to Tim Cummings question about the full extent as far south, but um, it is a different design, right? It's a different, it's a different kind of layout of the public space. You have Gene Porter and Peter Schaefer that both want to speak. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I can't see everybody's faces, so that's great. Gene. Thank you. Uh, this is very interesting. I like what's going on downtown right now. I have no idea how well utilized the city's parking garage is. I'm a fan of city owned and operated parking garages, but I would be more enthused if, uh, if you could present some information, some data on how well used the existing garage is. Can anybody address that? There is a study underway right now by the parking department to assess the garages, but also the other parking lots in the city. And um, so that data isn't readily available tonight, but I'd be more than happy to send you the information about it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, this is Pete Schaefer, 15 E Street. Hey, Pete. How you doing? Uh, one of the, the thoughts I had was, you know, um, you know, right now we're what, 80,000 people in Nashua. And, you know, how big do we think we're going to get over time? And what size should a downtown be for a city like us? you know, in whatever size we are. Uh, what I see here is uh, a plan for sort of one street and that's who we are. And I kind of see it when I go downtown, I see, you know, sort of almost like when you go to the other streets, just one down, like if you go to Spring Street, for example, it's like the back of the facade. You know what I mean? It's like, it doesn't really look like downtown. It's just the main street. You, I wonder if over time you'd want to like have a downtown that is more like a, you know, uh, almost like a circular area, you know, for example, if you say, you know, you want to park and walk or take a bus in the area, you know, you, you get there easier if you had it or a, a more in-depth type of uh, a downtown. I was wondering whether somebody ever gave that a thought. That's a good question, Pete. I think I heard most of it, but essentially you're talking about a larger circulation system um, and how we can all how we can access the larger area of downtown. Than uh, for example, you know, if you go behind turf, for example, you know, that could be an area where you have tables or things going on. I mean, you could do that all the way down to the bus station, for example. It, does, it looks like the back of a facade when you go back there, you know, you got, you got Main Street, well, the stores are in the back, you got the, you know, the back of the, it's almost like a stage, right? And it's all the way along Spring Street, really. I mean, you know, we're building more apartments there now. In one area, that's a big parking lot. But there's still other areas that are area that are somewhat open that are still like back of the facade. It seems like right. you're not really, you know, like if you just walk down one street, you don't think you're in Nashua. You're sort of in uh, the back of this this play. Yep. <laughs> That's sort of what it looks like to me. So I was yeah. just wondering if, you know, how, how big do we think we're going to get over time? I know we have limitations. We're not going to grow our bounds, you know, you know but... Uh, but you know, 80,000 now, are we going to 120,000 at some point or more? And do we view, what would we think of what downtown would look like then? Or would it be still the same size? 
I think Pete's, uh, this is Tim, I, Pete's question is an excellent one because um, I, 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 I think you, you, you're you onto something, Pete, which is in, important, which is um, uh, cities of a certain size can support a, a, a main street that does have a kind of, uh, that focuses all the energy on both sides of the street with the historic facades, the restaurants and things. And typically those downtowns are a little bit ragged in the back because that's where the parking is, right? And so in a downtown that needs to both accommodate people that are walking and biking to get there, but also people that are driving from other parts of the city or the region, that's the consequences of, of the evolution of downtowns. The Just behind those buildings is where the most convenient parking is. I think what you're asking is, should there be a couple of block area where the buildings in that couple of block area all face the sidewalk and the street so that the, those qualities that we're showing in Main Street here maybe extend not only along it, but perpendicular to it and maybe even to one of the parallel streets. And I think it's a really good question that's often driven by market interest and in, in a downtown that sometimes developers and investment drive that decision. Um, and sometimes uh, uh, municipalities um, encourage it by predicting where it, sh it should go and where it might go. But I, th I think it's a really good observation. What I was just thinking is, you know, we should also look at it since we're doing a plan is where do we think we want to be? You know, we're the second largest city in New Hampshire. Granted, that's not very big compared to all the cities in, in the United States. But in New Hampshire, it's pretty big, okay? And we're pretty close to uh, the biggest city in New Hampshire, okay? So we do have a lot of population. And the question is, do we see ourselves getting bigger? And how would we get bigger, you know, like that? Or do we just have a main street like everybody else has? Or it's a good really point. Bigger than that? Thank okay. you. I'm going to move on to South Main Street now because it's, we, I don't want, I want to use our time efficiently. So um, I'm going to go down to Main Street South and let Tim talk about this a little bit. Yeah, so, it, it, you know, th this is a different condition here and um, it's at a point in the city where the, the more historic urban fabric starts to break down into what's a little bit more of a suburban condition. And it's, um, it's where, uh, commercial development um, uh, has evolved into a much more kind of auto dominant kind of building pattern. Now that includes shopping center, some fast food restaurants um, uh, and things that you drive specifically to park right in front of or go through a drive through and then move on. It's a very different condition than even Main Street today. And uh, I think it partly is an answer to Pete's question and musings just a few minutes ago, which is that the, the, the land use in this section of Main Street is very inefficient. You know, buildings are pushed back from the street. Um, the, the building is a relatively small footprint in a sea mostly of parking. Um, what if some of that kind of urban fab fabric and, and urban design texture um, that drops off a little bit to the, from a little bit to the right of this image was reintroduced here, especially on properties that would in the medium term still preserve the parking for the shopping center. In other words, access to the shopping center could still um, uh, connect through between some of these new buildings. And you could start to claim the sidewalk here in a more pedestrian friendly way with more active uses that actually contribute to the sidewalk to encourage pedestrian life, even in this section of Main Street. And you'll see that in this case, the, um, the image includes little kind of pocket park-like patios and open spaces on the sides of the buildings um, to create places for uh, businesses, cafes and restaurants that might support that kind of life. Uh, this, um, as, as Sarah was showing by, by clicking on some of the, um, the kind of features here that are part of the website. This would also include um, 
uh, bike lanes and bicycle accommodations as well. So this is a, about enhancing uh, bicycle and pedestrian accommodations and maybe starting to, to tilt the development patterns from an auto dominant only one to one that also encourages those kinds of uses. And so all of those red uh, rectangles that you see are proposed new appropriately scaled development. Taskina, did I miss anything on my script here? <laughs> no, I, I think you hit them all. And just to follow up, you can definitely, you can see that the road diet here, the lane reducage is not continued because there are natural features such as the wetlands and private property that we don't have the same grid, right? There's no spring street down here um, to allow alternative routes around. So main street here doesn't have as many alternatives. And so keeping the lanes, the width of the lanes, but trying to work with the public realm and quality infill is the design that Util suggested. Yeah, and that's a good point, Sarah, because even in the down, the Main Street section we were just looking at, we, we, we carefully considered vehicle movements too, at least at a conceptual level. In the, in the previous drawing we were looking at, we included left turn lanes where we thought they would be necessary. In this case, Sarah's right, we're not reducing lanes, we're just reducing their dimension a little bit to grab a little bit more space for uh, bicycles and for pedestrians. But in this case, we're not we're not reducing the lanes themselves; only their dimension by a foot or two. So, um, this is a, um, a, a a a a proposal that really is about balancing vehicular access with pedestrians and bikes. Not not having pedestrians and bikes take over, dominate, or eliminate uh, 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 access by automobile. It's a kind of it's a kind of hybrid condition, but but we think a healthier one. One last point is that part of the idea of that new development is that um, it will start to promote a park once, do a couple of things culture here too. For example, you might park in the shopping center parking lot, and then uh, walk to a business establishment on Main Street maybe to get a coffee or have lunch or something. So that's in terms of understanding how the mix of the uses might actually complement each other, that's that's one of the things that we discussed. Thank you, Tim. Pete, did you have something? Yeah, one of the comments I would make is that I've never seen a parking lot full. I'm not ever sure if I've seen it half full, okay? So, I mean, there could be some possibilities here, even if you wanted to re reroute the bike path through there. I don't know about who owns what, understand? Okay, I mean, it used to be very different atmosphere here. There used to be a movie theater in here. You could go in there for a dollar. Okay, and there used to be to you know, pawn shops and everything. You go in there, all sorts of stuff. But the internet has changed that. Uh, the one thing I would say about the parking lot and that, and also all the stores with the supermarket is you got to be careful what you do with it because it's built on top of a pond. Right. You know, people, a lot of people don't know that. Okay. That's going to sink in 50 years. They're going to refill that parking lot again because it's going to go down a few feet. The last time they rebuilt this, I watched and they put in large concrete pillars to try to keep it all up. But we all know that's not going to work in the long run. So, you know, you could always put like even some parkish stuff in there. But again, it, it depends on who owns it. But they're not doing much with the parking lot itself because it never fills up. Thank you, Pete. Yep. Gloria, did you have a comment? Or? Oh, I I did. Um, I think Marianne may have even been on the board when when this was proposed a while ago uh, mm -hmm. to move the stores to closer to Main Street. I think the new Burger King, or mm -hmm. I think it's Burger King, when mm -hmm. that was built, one of the requirements was that that would be closer to Main Street so that it would so you could walk up to it without having to drive up to it. So this concept has been around for a while. Um, and some of the other places, the, like the CVS that's on the corner of and Main Street, that too was pushed back. And that was the, the request was that it be put up closer to the sidewalk so people could walk in and not just have to take their car. So, I mean, it's a good idea, but uh, and it certainly would enhance the, the look of, of the street. Um, but some of that has started to had started like years ago. Um, I don't know, Marianne, if you were, were on the board then or not was when uh, Kathy Hirsch was the uh, community development director, yes. which she had been working on at the time. 
And this is actually the old Main Street plan. This is very much, it, it, this isn't necessarily new. It's a continuation of that plan as it, it, this area, as you know, has had less development pressure and hasn't quite ripened as much as some others. Sarah, I just wanna um, comment. I think both for um, North Main Street and South Main Street, um, Peter's comment about you know, what we've talked about in terms of growing some of the side streets or some of those back streets and, and also looking at the pocket parks and, and the development for South Main Street. Um, we've all had conversations in the past about how that also promotes pedestrian usage because people feel safer. If, if there's development on a side street. And we had a conversation when we were talking about the building for the school street lot and putting retail on the lower level. So if people walk down school street, it's not just an empty building, there's some activity there. Um, and, and so I think that, that all of these things, um, although you maybe never directly think about them promoting um, walking, I think by virtue of providing um, more light at night and opportunities for people to be, people feel safer walking and then will walk if they live three or four blocks away, which of course is what we want them to do. Um, so I think all of this is, is really important um, to help people feel safe and comfortable. Definitely, thank you. All right, if so anybody just can I make one one comment, Pete, because I think the last comment and Pete's comment meant, uh, made me think that um, that in a way that underutilized parking lot in the shopping center is a parking resource to um, and that was you know legal agreements we have to get worked out like we mentioned in our earlier conversation, but. That, that's parking that exists that's a resource to incentivize this development to happen. Um, and uh, I suspect if development happened along Main Street, the way we're showing it, it would inspire the redevelopment of the shopping center to have more of the look and feel um, of the new development along the street. And in fact, a lot of uh, uh, shopping centers like this are being re repositioned now into shopping areas that have a little bit more of a kind of walkable urban feel. So I, I think um, that would probably be the likely outcome that the shopping center, you know, for the technical reasons that Pete um, just discussed, but even for reasons to reposition um, the, the kind of retail there, it, it would be likely over the long haul to look very different as well. Great, thank you, Tim. If everybody's okay, I'm gonna move on to um, the economic mobility and access to opportunity section. Oh, I see Pete. Okay, go ahead, Pete. You gotta unmute, bud. Thank you. I just wanna make one quick comment if I could. And that is, you know, Salmon Brook, if you go into the shopping area back here in the south side of that, you will find that there's a big pipe where there's water coming out of it. That's Salmon Brook, okay? It used to fill this pond here, that's now a parking lot. But that is Salmon Brook. You could have, and it's like, almost like a little parkish area you can't get to, is what that is back there if you've ever seen it, okay? You could actually have a little waterfall back there. It would be, could really be beautiful, okay? And it wouldn't take that much to do that. You, you have to worry about the flooding because uh, Salmon Brook you know, can get pretty high at some point. But that was the place that was the first place I believe that there was a business in Nashua when Nashua first got started. There used to be a sawmill there. And I think you could, we could make something of that. Thank you, Pete. Okay. All right, moving on, I'm gonna skip down. We'll talk about the other areas in, um, that I'm zooming by right now <laughs> with, as part of um, transportation and land use in the next couple meetings. But um, for tonight, I'm uh, jumping on to economic mobility and access to opportunity. And I will preface this by saying, again, these sections are not as pretty. We're talking words and tense, but we heard so many words from you that we're trying to summarize and organize in a way that is digestible here. Um, and so 
The overall goal was ensure national workers have access to opportunities in the city and the region for workforce training, career development, and quality education. And here are the action items, the six of them below that. Um, and you can click on the action items. Some of them have a recommendation underneath as well. If you're exploring these a little bit later on your, on your own, I'm not gonna read them all to you, but um, I will give a quick summary here for the purpose of discussion. So um, broaden our tax base to ensure a diversified revenue stream and create a, cre a range of jobs in the city's core and emerging sectors. Um, make sure we support future development in the priority development areas listed. Those are some of the scenarios that we'll be talking about that we have been talking about over the past eight months and we'll continue to be talking about soon. Amherst Street, DW Highway, um, Northeastern Boulevard, uh, Northwestern Boulevard, um, and making sure that we're talking about the key physical and social infrastructure, which means workforce training, but uh, as well as water, sewer, electrical, and broadband. We've heard a lot about broadband and that as a utility and the importance of broadband to the future of Nashua and our workforce and our um, education system. Um, revised zoning to allow buy right development uh, to contain a mix of retail and commercial uses, an area where we wanna prioritize this redevelopment. Um, this is something that we want as far as a way to make sure, we've heard a lot about streamlining the process um, and moving this quickly and making sure that we can be efficient in this to not waste time. And so that's one that reflects that. Ensure there's appropriate of it land available with footprints to um, support our rapidly growing R&D business. We want to facilitate partnerships with our local regional institutions and employers to foster innovation and a workforce pipeline. And Lastly, to ensure our transportation systems provide access to our job centers and corridors. So are there any things here that you see that you think we've stated in a way that isn't reflective of what we've, you've heard or said or that we're really missing as part of this one? I'm not sure whether it fits in this category or perhaps another one, but I've, I've seen a lot of people just make comments on Facebook that they wish there was um, a commercial kitchen as incubator space for people wanting to launch food-based businesses. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's a great one, Betsy. Thank you. We have heard a lot about that and actually have been talking about that as in relation to Main Street quite a bit in another project that we're working on, but I really appreciate you bringing it up directly as a specific action here that could be called out. Marianne, did you have a comment? I'm sorry, my phone's ringing, but um, Sarah knows this is near and dear to my heart. So um, that's why I seconded her yes. And, um, and Sarah and I have had conversations in the past with different people about developing space for that. Um, and so I, I think um, it certainly is, is important and, and it serves um, people in some of our immigrant communities who would like to get started um, having businesses and we've seen it um, be successful in other places. Um, I periodically get Ethiopian food from someone who is involved with Fork Lab up in Portland, Maine. And um, I just think it's a great opportunity and um, have long been an advocate. So I second that, Betsy. <laughs> yeah, there was a, a super cool um, incubator area down in Pittsburgh where there were probably six to eight um, startup like pop-ups in a food court and they rent their space and then as soon as they're ready and have a following they then move on and open their own restaurant and it was a really great way to go out and have some unique experience. It's absolutely a great point and um, just to plug some of the initiatives the mayor's working on um, through a Harvard Bloomberg leadership initiative that is something that he and his staff team and a bunch of us in the city are working on evaluating um, as part of feasibility and what kind of things would work to move that forward. So it is, it is a great point. Um, and thank you for bringing it up here because maybe that's something that needs to be a specific recommendation. 
I, th I think Sarah, we I think we incorporate a lot of that in the in the second uh, top goal for economic development. Awesome, thank you. So we just got to scroll down to local business. I think is what Tiskin is saying is just keep scrolling, Sarah. Um, so, so I'm going to keep scrolling unless anybody. Oh, Tim. Sarah, yeah. Can I just uh, can you can you go back for a second? I want to mm -hmm. raise this as a question. Um, so I'm assuming that this is not put in any type of particular order of priority. Um, and if that's incorrect, please let me know. Uh, but what I would ask is you not lead with broaden the tax base to ensure a diversified revenue stream over time to promote a creation of a range of jobs in the city and the core emerging sectors. I, 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 I agree that that is a top priority, but it, if you click on the recommendation, continue to recruit prospective employers in emerging 21st century. So that leads to an attraction type strategy in economic development. We do not typically focus a lot of our resources on marketing and attraction of outside employers. So if you do want to keep it as a top priority, um, I would ask that you, you know, reconsider the verbiage to be maybe to expand uh, current employers, or it's more of a retention and expansion strategy than, than recruiting. I mean, recruiting is an element to it, but it is not a main focal point. That's great. And the, just to be clear, these are not in any priority order at this moment, but that is, that is a really important point, Tim. Thank you. We'll make sure we make those corrections. Does anybody else have anything on this? Or I'm scrolling down to local businesses. I just want to say something really quickly. As soon as I saw that tax thing, when you started with the tax thing, I was saying the more taxes we collect, the more the state's going to say is that's a neck roll. We're going to take some of it from us. Right. So you do want to like rephrase that a bit or something, because that's the first thing that came to my mind is all more taxes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. So local business. We want to promote and support our local businesses that reflect our character of Nashua and foster opportunities for cultural tourism in the city, the creation of new small businesses with walkability and customer base density. So um, here we're talking about co-working spaces and mixed tenant models. Um, and the promote and encourage small business growth within the city with a focus on maker spaces, incubators, small scale fabricators, design-related enterprises, develop a program to provide mentorship to up and coming and underrepresented entrepreneurs in the city, support public realm improvements and placemaking in Nashua's commercial districts. We talked about that with Main Street a little while ago. Um, preserve some existing small office space in key locations as affordable options for some of our emerging small, emerging small businesses and develop storefront programs to improve small businesses, help them renovate and restore their commercial and retail facades. And looking at the signage ordinances, wayfinding and ensure high quality attractive signage while being sensitive to our business needs. Marianne. Yes, um, this as well as the other topic for this evening, um, arts and culture, um, made me think of previous conversations around an arts district and and what do we do with that and and using it to um, provide a designated area in the city maybe for some art specific development that's um, studio space as well as living space but then also um, having a bigger idea of an arts district. So it extends throughout downtown and um, it supports our arts. So it's not just this block in this redeveloped warehouse, but that's part of it, but it also encompasses other areas. And I think, um, you know, we need to think about how we do that to support our local artists, be they performing artists um, or you know, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, whatever they're doing, how do we support them and, and give them a space as well as 
letting people know when they read about Nashua, yes, we have this and, and we really want you to come and enjoy it. And this is what we can offer. So providing the living space and working space as well as designating um, a place to come for cultural tourism. So creating kind of an arts district that we, oh, that we make sure that we are providing all the necessary pieces for a live workspace and a destination area. Right, and I know we in the past have talked about what does that mean in terms of um, zoning and, and all of those sorts of regulations. Mm -hmm. uh, Definitely, thank you. Does anybody else wanna to add to this one? Okay, I'm gonna move on down to diversity. And just if you're ever navigating this website for yourself, there's a very easy button right here. It says TOC, it brings you right to the top and then you can click on the section. And I do promise with future agendas, I will give you the section number also in the list. So it's easier to follow along. I'm sorry, I did not do that this time, but it makes it much easier that way. So now we're on to diversity. Um, we wanna celebrate and integrate the diversity of cultures, religions, languages within our community and support this diversity throughout city policies and programs. So the actions we have are improve city re regulations to require more user-friendly, flexible public spaces for events and organizations to enhance interactions. We've heard a lot about the need to use public spaces um, and make it easy and efficient for everybody to use those spaces effectively. Um, so an inventory of indoor outdoor public spaces with their availability hours, location capacity, and how people can use those space and how they can be accessible. Develop key branding and wayfinding to welcome people to Nashua. We've talked about wayfinding a bunch of times tonight and make sure we're directing people appropriately. So many of these things feed into each other. It is hard to separate them into different sections and um, organize city sponsored block parties and outdoor events to take place in locations across Nashua as an opportunity to celebrate and highlight diversity in our neighborhoods. All right, anybody have ideas or comments? Marianne, I'll put your hand down because I think it's up from before. All right, if you think of something later that's missing too, you can always fill out that form or send an email. Paul. Hi, um, so, so I think this is just fantastic that we have um, in the master plan and put a focus on it, um, especially with the uh, attention that's being paid to the riverfront area um, and library plaza area. I think they're going to be Getting a lot of space that's ideal for these these kinds of programs. Uh, we we make do um, with with the things that we present um, in the Water Street surface parking lot, um, closing down blocks of, blocks of Main Street and, and and whatnot. But to really put the um, put the effort in and and uh, you know do this this true creative placemaking um, and and uh, creating this this open community space, I, I think is. Uh, really exceptional work that that the city has been uh, doing already, and and I'm looking forward to seeing how how all of that continues to materialize. Um, I I just want to add um, that um, in the cultivating vibrancy plan um, that I want to say was put together in in 2003, perhaps um, there was a uh, focus in one of the sections about presenting more programming on the, the funding side of this. And, and I know that this is kind of a higher level priority piece, but, but I just didn't want to go without saying that um, there, there are only so many sponsors that you can bring to the table for these kinds of things um, and ensuring that there's a, a focus in, in budgeting uh, to support additional programming. You know, I, I will say over the last five years that the city has has made uh, great strides in, in focusing and in growing the extent to which uh, this this kind of programming is supported. Uh, but to provide kind of a consistent uh, year round sense of vibrancy, um, a, a, a greater level of emphasis on, on providing funding to 
uh, produce uh, this kind of programming um, is it, it will really be important uh, moving forward. Thank you, Paul. And I do think it's appropriate to make sure that we call out as an action based on, you know, that the budgeting and funding to support these items comes forward. So thank you. Thank you. All right, scrolling down a little bit further, um, unless I see anybody um, onto arts and culture. So we wanna prioritize arts and culture as an important aspect of inclusive economic development and strengthening placemaking in our community. So we're talking about um, reevaluate land use tools to better accommodate arts and culture, outdoor venues and investment in current facilities that kind of echoes maybe some of what Marianne was saying with the arts district as well, just a little bit ago. Work with existing theaters and performance halls to develop special media advertising and marketing for future events. Um, create an online booking platform for parks and performance space. Again, so community groups can better um, participate, ensure that artists have a place to live, work, meet, and display works in the city. We have this amazing community. We want to make sure that there's every opportunity for them to be actively involved and engaged. Establish guidelines to create public art policy to determine what should be considered works of art versus signage and advertising and develop meaningful partnerships with city agencies and civic groups to enhance connection and communications with students and our different diverse populations and cultures within the city. So, not seeing, I know it is getting later. <laughs> I'm not seeing as many hands come up. I think I'm going to take that, um, oh, Sue, great. Take your time. All right, Th thank you. Sarah, I've been, I've been listening and this is my first opportunity to kind of look at all of this, but there was a comment, um, a few comments ago, I think it had to do with the library plaza area. And, and truly, I'm not trying to um, be any kind of a monkey wrench in this because this is all very interesting and looking forward. But on many, many occasions, not this past year of COVID when we couldn't really go anywhere, but at the library area late in the evening, like nine o'clock when nine o'clock ish time when I've been leaving meetings down there, we've got homeless people that are around there and probably about 8.30 at night, a lot of them start coming into the library to use the facilities and then to get try and get squared away for the evening. So along the river area, um, hanging around the library area, kids in schools that are um, housing challenge, is any part of this, the arts is good, every, everything is all real interesting, but what do we do about our populations that are um, challenged for even basic housing and they congregate downtown? That's a great question, Sue, and very fair. Um, certainly in the housing section, we do talk a lot about our homeless and this is a, it's not a Nashua only problem, right? And there's no easy solutions. Um, we do have a right. plan to activate the library plaza space very specifically with a redesign, which should activate that space as well. Um, but those, there are actually a lot of funds pouring into helping with homelessness and um, people in danger of homelessness right now from the American Recovery Act and some other sources. And so um, I know we are working with a lot of our nonprofit partners to do better in this avenue, um, but it is an important thing you brought up. So thank you. Yeah. Lindsay. Uh, hi folks, I'm Lindsay. I'm the chair of the Nashua Arts Commission. And I wanted to just mention for this part, and I'm not sure if it's appropriate here, but I would love to see somewhere in here about how the city might choose to capitalize on the use of the National Arts Commission to help execute some of these actions. I think that um, sometimes the, the Arts Commission uh, doesn't, 
have the opportunity to be able to help as much as we have the capacity to do. I think sometimes, and I would love to be able to, to foster that relationship more so with the city um, to help move a lot of these actions forward. So uh, I would love to see us be named in some way in the, as part of the overarching plan in order to help get the boots on the ground, um, if you think that's appropriate. I think it's very appropriate and I appreciate you bringing it up. That's a, it's a, we absolutely need to rely on, on all of you for your help in implementing this. Thank you, Lindsay. I'll just add that in the um, fourth action, the ensure the artists have a place to live, work, meet and play, uh, display, sorry. Um, there's a lot of um, sub recommendations under it and we see a lot of the arts commission being a part of that. Um, so, uh, I think that's like a perfect place where we can start. I think we also do start naming people there, but. Thank you. It makes sense to add the word affordable in there before live, work, meet and display. Like I was just chatting with a couple of local yeah. artists yesterday who can't afford to buy a house in Nashville, even though they've qualified for a pretty significant mortgage. Hello? Judy. Um, I really was very interested in this whole section. I think one of them, though, although um, I think the second one there, work with existing theaters and performance halls to develop special media advertising marketing for future events, attract more visitors. A lot of that's been going on through the Arts Commission's grants program. Many of the uh, performing arts nonprofits here in Nashville use their rent money to do just that. And I think this is a little narrow minded in what it's looking at is that the, you know, Nashua has a one, you know, the arts is, is a big draw to people, not only to live in a city, but also to visit a city. But it's not the only draw. And when you combine it with other things, if we're going to say the city is, we're going to ask the city to invest in some kind of marketing, it should be marketing uh, Nashville is a place to come and visit and a place to live, similar to what many other cities are doing and what the New Hampshire Division of Tourism and Travel already has wonderful resources to help us do. And they look at a combination of things. We have, you know, so much going on here in the arts, but to top it off, we have a riverfront now that's being developed. We have um, a very accessible, walkable downtown. We have uh, trails and hiking. You can come to Nashville and make a whole wonderful week out of just coming to this city and never be bored and have different things to do every day. And I think any kind of recommendation that comes out of this plan should take a broader scope. Yes, and of course, include the arts as part of it, but look at the bigger picture of why people would want to come and visit Nashua and look at the broader scope. Otherwise, you know, otherwise marketing is expensive and to, to do a real marketing program, I think we have to look at the bigger picture of what would draw people here and utilize as much of the resources of the New Hampshire Travel and Tourism Department that are available to us. Oh, thank you, Jenny. Could I throw in a comment that ties into that is I wonder if it's really about using the city's power as a leader and a convener to create ways for businesses and the arts community to collaborate on joint marketing around. Well, you, you can, you know, I would argue with you is that you look at any city, you look at Boston, you look, okay, they're bigger than Nashville is, but cities allocate funds for marketing and, you know, I, I just know from a lot of experience over the last 10 years of, of getting uh, people to fund stuff. It's not easy. And if we're trying to draw people to come to Nashua, I think having a recommendation to, to put some funding aside for a marketing program is the right way to go. Um, and not just say that we're gonna get everybody else to donate to it. You know, the city has to lead the way like other major cities do in doing this. And of course, looking at all the other aspects of it, but getting our chamber more involved in, in, in the arts would be a good start as well because 
you look at Concord, they're much more involved in the arts in Concord than they are here. But I, I think it would be a real statement to say um, at some point in time, maybe when the Performing Arts Center is up and running and we're further along on the waterfront development, um, to look at what it would take to work at, with the state at the state level and put some city funds into this as well. Thank you, Judy. Betsy, I just wanna make sure you can finish your statement. Sure, it was really about the idea. I don't disagree with anything Judy said. I think that makes a lot of sense, but to um, advertise Nashua more as a package. So it isn't just the standalone of the arts recruiting people to come enjoy the arts, but it's about come experience what Nashua has to offer right. and having the city help link the arts community and businesses that may not yet have a connection. Mm and all the retail shops and everything else. Thank you. Paul. I, I think that this is a, a great focus area for Nashua. I think we have a lot of opportunity. Um, I, I think the Great American Downtown has uh, gone to great lengths over the past five years, especially uh, advertising of the things that we have to celebrate and a lot of things that make Nashua an attractive place uh, to visit and to live. Um, however, we can be of uh, continued and, and group support in those efforts. Uh, we, we are absolutely happy to uh, be a part of any of that. Great, thank you, Paul. So GAD is a great facilitator for a lot of these conversations and this whole marketing idea. We'll make sure that's in the actions as well. Sarah, I have a question for the um, last action item. How is the cultural sector defined? Is that the arts and cultural sector? Um, as far as a topic area, it's an arts and culture section. No, um, no, for the last action item. Oh, yeah. Communicate with students, elderly, and cultural sector. What? Well, how is that defined? That is a great question. And I don't think I have a clear answer for you, but that certainly is something that <laughs> we can work on the language for to, um, to be more clear about exactly what that means. Um, okay, well, this is, I guess, as I look at this, I think of, I think of two ways, getting back to the earlier goal. Um, diverse communities, members of diverse communities kind of begin um, coming into communities and establishing businesses. And, and one is certainly food, um, be it owning a little local grocery store or a, a local restaurant, but the other is through the arts. And, and there are certainly people who immigrate here um, and end up calling Nashua home who have artistic abilities. So um, I think they should be included, at least that, that group should be included in the action item. Um, so I, I didn't know if that's what we were talking about as the cultural sector, or if the cultural sector was like the performing arts. I think Marianne to answer, like, to answer um, your question. I think it is exactly what you are saying. And also the other part of it is what we've been talking about, um, the visitors that also come to Nashua. So it's okay. how do we create this sort of cultural realm for Nashua and celebrate the people that are here. Um, okay. And I think that's what it encompasses. So you're absolutely right. Okay. I would just like to see something in there around including the people who are here and supporting them in developing their artistic capacity. Great, thank you. All right, I think actually, it looks like Paul's hand was raised first, even though he spoke recently. Paul, are you, is your hands left over raised or? Uh, yeah, it's, it's left over raised, sorry okay. about that. Great, next would be Betsy then. Hey, um, my question is, is would tourism be profitable for Nashua, drawing people to an arts and cultural center, or would it be better to focus on the residents and building a vibrant community for the people that live here and other people can join us, but um, the emphasis would be on bringing 
bringing joy and happiness and unity to those of us that live here. Let's be selfish. That's a great selfish statement. Thank you, Betsy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lindsay. I just wanted to uh, circle back to what uh, Mary Ann said. And I think a lot of what you were talking about in terms of the cultural sector, Mary Ann, might be de further defined um, in the hopefully the next phase of the National Arts and Culture Plan. So again, if we felt that it was relevant, I think it wouldn't hurt to have this larger overarching plan um, have some language that includes th that there's like a, 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 a sense of unity with whatever the current Nashua Arts and Culture Plan um, puts forth in order to help you know, accomplish, you know, these objectives and, and the ones that are more specific and within like a smaller time frame um, that are in, in that plan. So I think having similar language where the plans are supporting each other might be beneficial is the summary of that. And then the second comment is um, kind of uh, circling back to what I, I got a chance to take a look closer at what Teskina pointed out in, I believe it was the fourth action, the third recommendation um, and then like the first to bullet underneath that, create a public art commission with members, including local artists, blah, blah, blah. So mm -hmm. I guess my question is, is the intent for that to be a different organization than the existing one? No. And I think it's just a miscommunication between UTL and, and I, and, and us that we didn't explain that we already have this organization and that is your organization. And so that's all it is. There is no intention to create a new one. It's to recognize the one we have and point these actions towards that existing commission. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure about that, that um, verbiage was, you know, made clear. So we knew, right? But I also think that's part of the point that I think comes up a lot in our arts commission meetings as well is that I think a lot of folks within the arts community that exists, but otherwise, uh, but also otherwise, um, you know, don't communicate as well as we could. And I would love to see some kind of action um, that relates to uh, a streamline of communication so that these resources, um, you know, are more accessible to everyone. And I think a lot of these actions touch on that, especially like the online booking platform and, and things like that. But uh, part of the reason why I definitely wanted to point out, you know, other, other than for my own selfish reasons about the National Arts Commission, uh, is that I think that uh, they could be tasked with more. Uh, and we could be accomplishing uh, more. And I think that often even the current city bodies don't recognize us as an asset. And that's completely fair. And I think it's a good point here about how we can specifically tie this plan to that commission and the future work of that commission doing the um, doing your next level of strategic planning too, right? And making sure that these actions here support each other and mirror each other. Awesome. Thanks. Hey, hey, Sarah, can I jump in on this? Please. So I do feel like I have an obligation to point out that, um, and I want to say for the record, as a disclaimer, I am not a self-identified arts person. Those of you who know and work with me, probably that's self-evident, but my office uh, tends to work the most closely with the various arts groups at a grassroots level. Um, and it has become very apparent to me, and I think Lindsay hit it on the head, that they don't, there isn't an open line of communication and or facilitation of, of, of a common, you know, uh, culture. Mm -hmm. um, with that also being said, I know the various art groups also would not want to submit themselves to be approved by an entity. So I, you know, so I don't think you have consensus there that you know the various public arts groups in this community would want to lose their sovereignty if you will uh to be able to create the public art that they would be looking to make um i have no opinion on that i just think i need to bring that to the table for you to be aware of that's a great point thank you tim sarah yep if, if i could just make one other comment um i think that you know, we're, we're planning for the future. So right now, 
when we think arts and culture, we're pretty much downtown centric. But I think we need to think about more citywide. So if you get outside of the downtown area, um, what, what are the possibilities in South Nashua? What are the possibilities um, over where Peter lives? What are the possibilities in the North End and, and Greeley Park? And, and how does this all come together? Because um, certainly it's more than downtown. And, and sometimes um, we, we need to bring things to people so they can enjoy them and not have to get into their cars and come downtown all the time. So um, I think that that needs to be a consideration that hopefully in the next 10 years, we are going to see parts of the city develop their own identity as we implement some of these plans. So the Amherst Street Corridor maybe may take on a neighborhood name. And so it will be a separate neighborhood from downtown. And so thinking about how we infuse this into those neighborhoods as they continue to develop so residents can enjoy them where they are. That's a great point. Thank you, Marianne. All right, I am um, not seeing any more hands at the moment. So I'm going to jump to the economic development and the two goals under that. Um, so the next is employment diversity. Oh, it's almost 7.30. So I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly. Bear with me, please. Um, great conversation tonight. So we want to facilitate the growth of a strong and diverse business sector to expand opportunities, attract new workers and ensure a range of jobs that align with local talent and skills. So encourage growth in emerging innovation based economic centers around medical devices, robotics, biosciences and similar industries. Recognize the role of place in attracting the necessary talent to make these companies competitive and recruit workers here. Facilitate and encourage the creation of new types of working spaces, co-working incubators, boutiques, um, consumer product workshops, kind of the make it labs um, that we already have one of in the city that's incredibly important. Um, and other mixed use development areas to support, support and promote these types of businesses. Bolster tourism through a comprehensive approach of incorporating accessible river, pedestrian experiences that link our amenities and public arts and um, curated uses and activities. So this kind of gets to what we were all just talking about in the last one and it is listed here. And use city policy to promote businesses that adopt sustainable practices. Betsy? Hi, so for anybody who was at the um, Chamber Eminence Awards today, we heard remarks that, you know, 20 years ago, one in 10 Nashua residents were diverse, and nowadays it's one in four. And several of those are also foreign born. And so as we talk about sort of a diverse workforce and diverse businesses, I wonder if there could be something put in there around um, education for speaking English. I know the Adult Learning Center has programs or things like that, but just to specifically call out the need for as many um, supportive educational programs that are available for people wanting to learn English. That's a great idea. And maybe we can include um, being a little bit more specific when we were talking about workforce development and, and the earlier section, but that's a great one. Thank you, Betsy. Sarah, yes. I, I just, um, I have to comment on action to um, recognizing the role of quality of place. Um, we moved here 25 years ago and I remember um, the realtors that were part of our original come and see what there is um, commenting and saying, we couldn't believe that you would want to move up here because the best thing we could offer you was um, the Pheasant Lane Mall, Tilton, I think, and driving an hour to the seacoast. And we were coming from the Baltimore DC area where we could easily access 
everything Washington has to offer. Um, but I think also going along with that is um, we have to remember public education is important too. And coming up here, I mean, one of the things we certainly looked at was what are schools like up here and how many neighborhood options do we have for, for um, looking for houses. So I think that's an important piece. And then to the marketing of all of that. And um, I mean, we moved here in 96 and I remember walking into design where and um, um, Julia Ward's partner in starting the business knew where we came from and said, oh, if you'd been transferred here two years ago, you would have never come. And, and so I, I think all of what we're talking about really supports this action item um, because it gives us, it brings more diversity and, and just really grows the quality of our city. Thank you. I think we're talking about quality of place and quality of life for our residents in many places here. And the other Betsy brought that up earlier too. Hey, hey, hey Sarah. Yes, sir. I got a question for you here. I'm not sure if it's appropriate in this section or somewhere else, but I, uh, in the economic development section, but I think having housing clearly linked as part of an economic development strategy is, uh, is really important. Um, so again, I'm not sure if it's appropriate yep. to add in this section, but definitely in one of these subsections, uh, I, I can tell you that, you know, this administration's whole economic development agenda you know, uh, and I shouldn't say whole, but a bit, a large part of it is really focused on, you know, housing and creating housing opportunities to bring the qualified uh, workforce that would help support the employers that are in the region. Yep, that's a great point, Tim. Thank you. All right. Um, so this is the last one for tonight: um, location and regional position. It's important that we acknowledge where we are in the larger region. And as part of Nashua's competitive advantage is both being the hub of our general region and straddling the border between the Boston area and being the gateway city. Um, so we both draw on and contribute to the employment and housing in both of these regions. And one of the very first meetings we had, UTL put this great map up that showed um, you know, where people work versus where people live and, um, and all those lines and you can find it in our existing conditions report, but it's, you know, a third of our population before COVID commuted south on Route 3 for work every day. Um, and there's a massive amount of people who come back up Route 3 to work in Nashua as well. So um, we need to really embrace that competitive advantage and do we can to incentivize that cross-border um, cooperation, both for businesses and employees and um, workforce training um, and transportation. Um, so, um, and this also feeds very much into our conversation around rail that is going on, at, that has been going on in Nashua for 20 plus years and is picking up steam at the state level at the moment. Um, and so it really does underscore the importance of our transit oriented development. There's a couple areas that we have already put that in place in anticipation of rail coming, um, but these mix of different workspace, workspaces, walkable places, um, and housing options of all sizes and types. And Sarah, might I just say, exit 36 southbound. <laughs> yes. For those of you who don't know what Marion means by exit 36 southbound, um, <laughs> that is um, you know where exit one is, I'm sure, um, which has a north and a south. Currently, there's an exit 36 if you're coming from Massachusetts towards New Hampshire. They, oh, there, there, yeah, there is. You can get off from Massachusetts towards New Hampshire. It's no longer numbered 36 for the record. Oh. Yeah, they've changed the number. Oh, reflects that's the funny. mileage now. Yeah. Oh, yes, I did see that the other day when they were said they're exit. using the federal oh, requirement. Right. So anyways, there is an exit from Massachusetts if you're coming north that you can get off and go right at the kind of mall exit, right? Instead of having to go up to Route 1, which has relieved some traffic pressure on DW Highway, 
but there is no southbound exit at that point. And so Exit 36 South is a campaign that's probably been under discussion for at least 15 years. The Regional Planning Commission has done, did a ton of work on it about the, the time and effort and costs and of not having it. Um, but it is a it's a it's a more difficult project specifically because it really benefits New Hampshire residents and New Hampshire businesses, but all the land is in Massachusetts. And so it's we can't really use New Hampshire tax dollars to pay for improvements in Massachusetts and vice versa. And so it is a cross-border cooperation that's needed. And while I do think that parties are more than happy to talk about it when it comes to putting money on the table, it is definitely something that we're always keeping an eye out for those very large federal grants that would appreciate a partnership between the two states on. I just want to say that it's been going on for at least 30 years, by the way. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Good correction. <laughs> Right. Well, I just want to say thank you all for participating tonight and giving of your time. We're a little bit over what we said we'd end at 730. Again, this is the first of, there'll be five more of these topic specific Zoom meetings. Um, and I would encourage you all, we will be Saturday morning at the Library Plaza um, space where there will be, uh, where we'll have um, kind of a boards up and almost a science fair style so we can come and see each other in person crazy. Um, and we'll have the more traditional stickies to help us prioritize some of these action items. And we hope to see you Saturday morning at the library between 10 and 12. Again, if you can't make that or you can't make any of these meetings and something comes to you, please fill out that online form or send us an email. The form is the best, but um, we would love to get your feedback and we really want to make sure we have this right. Um, and so thank you all for your participation tonight.